This is Nelson Olmstead. Sleep no more. Sleep no more. Turn down the lights. Sink back in your chair and don't look into the shadows. In the shadows, there may be moving things. Tonight, it may be, you will sleep no more. Good evening. This is Ben Grauer introducing tonight's tale of terror, told by Nelson Armstead on the National Broadcasting Company's presentation of Sleep No More. The story of terror can be as simple as a sheeted ghost rattling chains. It can be a complex and hidden world of horror, lurking in such unholy dimensions as only the dead and the moonstruck can glimpse. Or it can be those terrible fathomless shadows which lie buried deep in the primitive mind of civilized man. And for this evening, well, Nelson Olmstead, tell us about this evening's story. Thank you, Ben. The first of our two tonight is a detective story with an unusual twist. It's about a man who solves a crime the hard way. The story by Rupert Croft Cook is entitled Banquo's Chair. <laughs> Sir William Brandt was a man whom I respected for the wholeheartedness with which for 30 years he had applied himself to the one form of research in which he was interested. He had risen to the head of the English Criminal Investigation Department and I think had enjoyed doing so. In his quiet, pipe-smoking way, he had considered the innumerable problems which his work had presented to him and although with no very spectacular performances, he had succeeded in a vast proportion of the cases on which he worked. One quality in his methods was not mentioned in the eulogies with which the press celebrated his retirement from office, although during my ten years' association with him, I commented on it frequently. It was a sort of glinting mercilessness, a cruel, steely determination to outwit his culprits. I suppose that anyone in his position would tend to become callous, but toward the end, it was plain to me that he regarded human nature as an abstract quantity, much as a scientist might regard a strange gas which it was his business to analyze. The motives of people, their arbitrary behavior in peculiar circumstances, their weaknesses, only appealed to Brent as part of the intensely interesting game of detection. Well, after he retired, I wondered what he would find to fill the place of all that had occupied him so long. I wasn't kept long in doubt, however. Within a short time of his leaving Scotland Yard... I received an invitation which could only mean that his former activities were not forgotten. He wrote, Will you come and dine with me at Turret House, Sydenham, on Thursday? Robert Stone will be there and a third guest, and I can promise you an unforgettable evening. Well, naturally, I had no intention of missing such an intriguing invitation, and I wrote my acceptance immediately. And flippantly, I added the postscript, Shall I come armed? The answer came by telegram and consisted of one word. Yes. Well, on the appointed day, I reached Turret House in spite of a gusty November storm. I found it to be one of those red brick somber mansions built here with ample gardens in the more spacious time of the late Queen. It stood back from the road behind tossed and dripping pine trees in the dejection of a district which had known better days. I didn't like the house. The door was opened by Lane, the manservant whom I recognized from Sir William's more cheerful home in the West End. He took my coat and I stepped into the hall. And then, to my surprise, I was shown straight into the dining room. Brent rose at once and greeted me over the corner of a large mahogany table laid for dinner. And he said, You will excuse this. As a matter of fact, it's the only room we use. And I said, Oh, well, then you don't live here? No, no. But you shall hear everything in a moment when Stone turns up. Meanwhile, a martini. Well, we hadn't long to wait for Robert Stone, that humorous, wiry little writer who had traveled almost everywhere and was reputed to have fought a duel with a German ex-prince in the laboratory of the Café Royal. 
And as soon as he entered, he said, What the devil do you mean, Brent, by dragging me out to this red mausoleum? My dear chap, I promised you something of an evening. Now, if you can't trust me, you can go straight home. By no means. I want some dinner anyhow. But what a, what a, what a cowhouse of a room. Now, just sit down there, Stone, and listen. We haven't very much time before the arrival of our third guest. Now, <clears throat> perhaps you may remember a murder which took place in this suburb some time ago. It was called the Sydenham murder and caused considerable comment at the time because there was no arrest. <laughs> but it was perfectly obvious. I knew from the first who did it, the nephew. Yes, the police knew it too. Well, then why the devil... Exactly. It was a common question. Well, unfortunately... The nephew had an absolute and unimpeachable alibi. To have arrested him would have meant merely a waste of time and money and a release in the end. Besides, a man discharged can never be arrested in the same murder charge. Well, anyway, I persuaded the people of the yard to leave the matter to me and give me all the time I wanted. Well, tonight, gentlemen, you are to see the last act in, uh, may I be permitted to say, the drama. <laughs> you see... It was in this house that the murder took place on November 17th last year. That is, a year ago today. Old Miss Ferguson, whose habits were as eccentric as any old ladies might be expected to be when she inhabits a house like this in solitude, gave her one maid the customary evening out and sat down alone to dinner in this room. On that night, when her servant returned, she found her mistress strangled. Now, there seemed no doubt at first of the nephew's guilt. He was the old lady's sole heir. He was heavily in debt. He had a latch key to the house. He'd even been hurt and to threaten her on previous occasions. But when he was questioned, the result was a perfect alibi. It was one of those rare cases in which the police know their man, but they are powerless. Well, after my retirement, I, I, I had every opportunity to think over the case, and at last I thought I saw a means by which, with infinite patience and devotion of time to the matter, I might bring the fellow to book. Well, now, luck has favored me. For instance, Bedford, the nephew, decided to let this house furnished soon after the event. It was in taking it that I got to know him, and it was to my interest that the acquaintance should be fostered into uh, a friendship. Now, he is a vain man, and he could see nothing incongruous in my desire for his company. But it was another quality of his which led me to the plan that I have adopted, his superstition. It's a fault shared almost without exception, by all criminals. Well, tonight is the anniversary of the murder. And tonight, Mr. John Bedford will dine with us. Yes. <laughs> I have enlisted the aid of Miss May Decklethorpe, undoubtedly our best tragic actress. Now, during dinner, she will enter the room in the precise likeness of the murdered woman. We, of course, shall remain outwardly unconscious of her. Only Bedford will be aware of her presence. In this way, I hope to wring some sort of a confession from the man. <laughs> yes, you remember Macbeth and the ghost of Banquo. Yes, but, but Sir William, do you really imagine that he will come here on this night in these circumstances? Well, most certainly, Robert. He has already dined with me four or five times, and tonight there is a special inducement. He is to meet you, Robert Stone. His vanity is touched by the opportunity. Now, now one or two other points I must explain before he arrives. I have a number of police in the house, uh, though somehow I don't anticipate violence. And during dinner, the electric lights will be switched off at the main, and the candles will be lit. We must have the correct atmosphere. Do you understand? Well, even before we had time to agree that we did, Lane announced Mr. John Bedford. A man in his late thirties hurried into the room, a tallish man, prematurely bald, with a weak droop to the corners of his mouth, and yet a curiously hard look in his eyes. A face which at first sight seemed precise, appeared on scrutiny to be vicious. We sat down almost at once to dinner, hurrying over the introductions to do so. And when the soup had been served, Sir William turned to Bedford and he said, How, how is the weather now? It's a beastly night. But really, Sir William, you must allow me to congratulate you on your cook. This soup is a masterpiece. Ah, yes. And thereby hangs a tale. Yes, my old cook had been with me 20 years, but she absolutely refused to stay in this house. She said it was haunted. Oh, Stone, this sort of thing amuses you. I should like you to see the silly old body giving me notice because she had seen the figure of an elderly lady with a scar on her neck walking about the passages. <laughs> But it did no harm in a way. My new cook is an artist. Why, Mr. Bedford, my dear chap, you don't look well. I expect you're a bit fagged out. 
Well, it's a rotten journey down here. No, 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 not a bit. Only, if you'll forgive me for saying so, I, I find this room confoundedly hot. Oh, I am so sorry. I hadn't noticed it at all. Lane, Lane, open the window, will you? As Lane, the butler, threw open the window, the noise of the rain and wind was plainly audible outside, and Stone spoke up. <laughs> Isn't our climate vile? Really, I don't know why we stay in England for the winter. This time last year was in the Riviera. And uh, I, I was in the United States, I added, feeling that I must add something to the conversation. And Sir William was thoughtful. He said, oh, now let me see. November 17th. Yes, now this time last year I was in London following the news, watching the course of events. Uh, Lane, uh, give Mr. Bedford some more wine. Well, the situation, even for me, was becoming intolerable. Bedford was mopping his brow and there was a flicker and our guest was shut out from our sight. Lane, said Sir William sharply, what on earth is wrong with the light? I I'll find out, sir. And the butler hurried out. For a moment, we were left in complete darkness, during which I think most of us drank. And then Lane appeared with candles, and he said, The electric light is out of order, sir, and none of us understands it. And suddenly, as he spoke, I became aware of another figure in the room. Behind Sir William's chair was the image of an old lady with great suffering apparent in her forlorn face. Now, I had seen May Dacklethorpe in some of her greatest successes, but this makeup, I thought, was a masterpiece. It gave one the impression of lurid unreality. Why, well, I scarcely dared look at the man opposite me to see what impression the figure had made in his already distraught mind, but apparently he hadn't seen it. I turned to the food of my plate, and as I did so, I heard a low cry from Bedford. And Sir William smiled, and he said, Why, what's the matter, my dear chair? Uh, nothing. No, nothing. No, I, I, I wish we could have some light, Sir William. Uh, half darkness invariably gets in my nerves. I can't say how sorry I am that this should have happened, but no doubt Lane won't be long in setting the lights right. Meanwhile, another glass of champagne. Thanks, sir. Uh, yeah, thanks. He drank hurriedly, and then, setting down his glass with a crash, he burst out, Don't any of you say anything! You must! You must! Well, my dear Bedford, you're unwell. Sit down. Is there anything I can do for you? It was painful to watch the effort Bedford took to get a grip on himself. I'm well enough, thanks. And I saw that his eyes were half closed and he was trying to rivet them on his plate. The strain was affecting us all. Conversation had dropped entirely and then, very slowly, the woman, whom we couldn't watch, except secretly, began to move toward him. That was too much. He became pitiably hysterical. He tried to rise from his seat and he shouted, Let me by! Out of my way! I'll do it again! I'll do it again. Let me get by. I'll murder you again, you witch. I did it once and I'll do it again if you don't get out of my way. It was over. Two police officials were in the room at once and Sir William said, I think you can arrest that man. You've heard his confession. Bedford had sunk limply into his chair and was sobbing dementedly. The police almost lifted him from it as they handcuffed him. But he said nothing more as they led him from the room. I don't think he yet realized what had happened. Stone was the first to break the silence. He said, oh, Satisfied? Oh, Christ. It's been a long job. It has ended as I knew it would. I'm most grateful to both of you. Now, we'll continue our interrupted dinner. Well, I thought it was a pretty grim affair. Your third-degree methods repel me, Sir William, but I suppose you know your job. Certainly May Decklethorpe did. Her acting was superb, and her makeup was incredibly good. Yes. Yes, we must congratulate her. I wonder where she's gone. Upstairs, perhaps. I had a room arranged for her. Lane. Sir? Uh, just see where Miss Dacklethorpe is. Yes, sir. Thank you. And Lane left the room. He returned almost immediately. I've uh, questioned the police at the door, sir, but they know only of the arrival of Mr. Stone and your friend. No lady has entered the house, but this telegram arrived for you, sir. Brent tore open the envelope, and after a pause, he said, Good Lord. Listen to this. Extremely sorry. Severe influenza, quite unable to leave bed. And it's signed, May Decklethorpe. So 
much for Banquo's Chair by Rupert Croft Cook. Now, Mr. Olmsted, what's the second story on tonight's agenda? The second story, Ben, is quite different. It was written by one of the all-time greats in the field of the short story, Guy de Maupassant. This is the story of a man whose moral fiber wasn't strong enough to sustain him in a crisis, and it's called The Coward. In society, he was called Handsome Signols. His name was Vicomte Gautrin Joseph de Signols. An orphan and possessed of an ample fortune, he cut quite a dash, as they say. He had an attractive appearance and manner, could talk well, had a certain inborn elegance, an air of pride and nobility, a good mustache, and a tender eye that always finds favor with women. He was in great demand at receptions, waltzed to perfection, and was regarded by his own sex with that smiling hostility accorded the popular society man. He had been suspected of more than one love affair calculated to enhance the reputation of a bachelor. He lived a happy, peaceful life, a life of physical and mental well-being. He had won considerable fame as a swordsman and still more as a marksman. And it often said, when the time comes for me to fight a duel, I shall choose pistols. With such a weapon, I'm sure to kill my man. One evening, having accompanied two women friends with their husbands to the theater, he invited them to take some ice cream at Tortoni's after the performance. They'd been seated a few minutes in the restaurant when Signols noticed that a man was staring persistently at one of the ladies. She seemed annoyed and lowered her eyes. The vicomte abruptly left his seat. He couldn't allow this insolent fellow to spoil an ice for a guest of his. It was for him to take cognizance of the offense, since it was through him that his friends had come to the restaurant. He went across to the man and he said, Sir... You are staring at these ladies in a manner I can't permit. I must ask you to stop. And the other replied, Let me alone, will you? You Take care, sir. You will force me to extreme measures. The man replied with a single word, a foul word which could be heard from one end of the restaurant to the other and which startled everyone there. There was a dead silence. Then suddenly a sharp, crisp sound. The vicomte had slapped his adversary's face. Everybody rose to interfere. Cards were exchanged. When the Vicomte reached home, he walked rapidly up and down his room for some minutes. He was in a state of too great agitation to think connectedly. One idea alone possessed him a duel. But this idea aroused in him as yet no emotion of any kind. He had done what he was bound to do. He would proved himself to be what he ought to be. He would be talked about, approved, congratulated. He repeated aloud, speaking as one does when under the stress of great mental disturbance, what a brute of a man. And then he sat down and began to reflect. He would have to find seconds as soon as the morning came. Now whom should he choose? He thought of the most influential and best-known men of his acquaintance, and his choice fell at last upon the Marquis de la Tourfoy and Colonel Bourdin, a nobleman and a soldier. That would be just the thing. Their names would carry weight in the newspapers. He was thirsty and drank three glasses of water, one after the other. Then he walked up and down again. Now, if he showed himself brave, determined, prepared to face a duel in deadly earnest, his adversary would probably draw back and proffer excuses. He picked up the card he had taken from his pocket and thrown on the table. He read it again, as he had already read it, first at a glance in the restaurant, and afterwards on the way home in the light of every gas lamp. Georges Lamille, 51 Rue Mossy. That was all. And the Vicomte once more repeated aloud, What a brute! So, he would have to fight. Should he choose swords or pistols? For he considered himself as the insulted party. With the sword, he would risk less... But with the pistol, there was some chance of his adversary backing out. A duel with swords is rarely fatal, since mutual prudence prevents the combatants from fighting close enough to each other for a point to enter very deeply. With pistols, he would seriously risk his life. But on the other hand, he might come out of the affair with flying colors and without a duel after all. And he said, I must be firm. The fellow will be afraid. 
sound of his own voice startled him, and he looked nervously around the room. He uh, felt unstrung. He drank another glass of water and then began undressing preparatory to going to bed. As soon as he was in bed, he blew out the light and shut his eyes, reflecting, I have all day tomorrow for setting my affairs in order. I must sleep now in order to be calm when the time comes. But he couldn't sleep. He was thirsty again, and he rose to drink. And then a qualm seized him. Can it be possible that I'm afraid? Well, no, indeed he couldn't be afraid, since he was resolved to proceed to the last extremity, since he was irrevocably determined to fight without flinching. And yet he was so perturbed in mind and body that he asked himself, is it possible to be afraid in spite of oneself? And this doubt, this fearful question, took possession of him. If an irresistible power, stronger than his own will, were to quell his courage, what would happen? He would certainly go to the appointed place. His will would force him that far. But supposing when there, he were to tremble or faint. And he thought of his social standing, his reputation, his name. Suddenly, he could see himself distinctly lying on his back on the couch he had just left. He had the hollow face and limp hands of death. He made a fire. His hands quivered nervously as they touched the various objects. His head grew dizzy, his thoughts confused, disjointed, painful. A numbness seized his spirit as if he had been drinking. And all the time he kept on saying, What shall I do? What will become of me? His whole body trembled spasmodically. He rose and, going to the window, drew back the curtains. The day, a summer day, was breaking. Well, what a fool he was to let himself succumb to fear before anything was decided, before his seconds had interviewed those of Georges Lamille, before he even knew whether he would have to fight or not. He bathed and dressed and left the house with a firm step. He repeated as he went, I must be firm, very firm. I must show that I am not afraid. His seconds, the Marquis and the Colonel, placed themselves at his disposal, and having shaken him warmly by the hand, began to discuss details. The Colonel took charge. You uh, want a serious duel? Yes, it's quite serious. You insist on pistols? Yes. Hmm. Do you leave all the other arrangements in our hands? Uh, well, 20 paces at a given signal, uh, the arm to be raised and not lowered, the shots to be exchanged until one or the other is seriously wounded. Excellent conditions. You are a good shot. All the chances are in your favor. And they parted. The Vicomte returned home to wait for them. His agitation, only temporarily allayed, now increased momentarily. He felt in arms, legs, and chest a sort of trembling, a continuous vibration. He could not stay still, either sitting or standing. His mouth was parched, and he made every now and then a clicking movement of the tongue as if to detach it from his palate. He attempted to take lunch, but he couldn't eat. Then it occurred to him to seek courage and drink, and he sent for a decanter of rum, of which he swallowed, one after another, six small glasses. A burning warmth was followed by a deadening of the mental faculties. But at the end of an hour, he had emptied the decanter, and his agitation was worse than ever. A mad longing possessed him to throw himself on the ground, to bite, to scream. <laughs> a ring at the bell so unnerved him that, that he hadn't the strength to rise to receive his seconds. He dared not even speak to them, wish them good day, or utter a single word, lest his changed voice should betray him. The colonel said to him, My dear fellow, <clears throat> all is arranged as you wish. The, uh, your adversary claimed at first the privileges of the offended party, but he yielded almost at once and accepted your conditions. His seconds are two military men. Uh, thank you. You're uh, all right? You're quite calm? Perfectly calm. Thank you. The two men withdrew. When he was once more alone, he felt as though he should go mad. His servant, having lighted the lamps, he sat down at his table to write some letters. And when he had traced at the top of a sheet of paper the words, This is my last will and testament, he started from his seat, feeling himself incapable of connected thought, of decision in regard to anything. So... He was going to fight. He could no longer avoid it. Then what 
possessed him. He wished to fight, he was fully determined to fight, and yet in spite of all his mental effort, in spite of the exertion of all his willpower, he felt that he couldn't even preserve the strength necessary to carry him through the ordeal. He tried to conjure up a picture of the duel, his own attitude and that of his enemy. And every now and then his teeth chattered audibly. He opened a case of Festine Renette's, which stood on a small table, and took from it a pistol. Next, he stood in the correct attitude for firing and raised his arm. But he was trembling from head to foot and the weapon shook in his grasp. He looked at the weapon and raising the hammer saw the glitter of the priming below it. The pistol had been left loaded by some chance, some oversight, and the discovery pleased him. He didn't know why. If he didn't maintain in presence of his opponent the steadfast bearing which was so necessary to his honor, he would be ruined forever. He would be branded, stigmatized as a coward, hounded out of society. And he felt he knew that he couldn't maintain that calm, unmoved demeanor. And then he did the thing that was to brand him forever with the name he feared, the ultimate act of cowardice. Opening his mouth wide, he suddenly plunged the barrel of the pistol as far back as his throat and pressed the trigger. When the valet, alarmed at the report, rushed into the room... He found his master lying dead upon his back. A spurt of blood had splashed the white paper on the table and had made a great crimson stain beneath the words, This is my last will and testament. can turn up the lights now. You can look around you. Nobody is there, really. Everything is all right, isn't it? Step over here, Nelson Olmstead, and tell us about next week's story. Well, next week, Ben, we have two stories. The first is by the great Jack London, and it's called to build a fire. It concerns a man in the Yukon and his deadly struggle with cold, which was 70 degrees below zero. The second, by George G. Tudus, has an odd and menacing title. It's Three Skeleton Key, with no S, because it refers to the name of an island or key off the coast of Guiana. I know you'll enjoy both stories, so plan to join us next week at this same time. You have been listening to Sleep No More, an NBC Radio Network production directed by Daniel Sutter. Mr. Armstead records exclusively for Vanguard Records. Until next week, when Nelson Armstead will again be here in person, this is Ben Grauer. Saying good night. You may win a thousand dollars. Just send a postcard with your name, address, and phone number to Jingle Jangler Contest, care of NBC Bandstand, Box 515, New York 19, New York. That's Jingle Jangler Contest, care of NBC Bandstand, Box 515, New York 19, New York. Send your postcard today, and Burt Parks may call you and offer you an opportunity to win $1,000. Tune in NBC Bandstand every weekday morning for full details. This is the NBC Radio Network.